Uh, hi everyone, my name's Dan. Um, I run a small company called Three Address Code. It's, uh, we build proprietary uh, trading software. Uh, it's basically a lifestyle business so that my brother and I don't have to get real jobs. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about uh, bin utils. Uh, if anybody's used it or knows what I'm talking about, can I just get a show of hands? Maybe anybody uses bin utils on a regular basis. Oh, okay, great, not, not too many people. And if I can get another show of hands who's a programmer or a dev or, or somebody who's, okay, great, that's, that's very good. Um, yeah, my talk is, for, is, is aimed more towards developers than, than anybody else. Um, just a quick disclaimer, um, I'm no expert. Uh, part of the reason I'm doing this talk is so that I can uh, make sure that I know these tools a, a, a bit better. Also, I don't want this to be a lecture, so if anybody has suggestions or corrections or if I say something blatantly wrong, please just say um, I'm not interested in, in pretending that I know what I'm talking about. Okay, so what is Binutils? Oh, sorry, we've had some problems with the screen. So Binutils is a gigantic library of programs that support creation, manipulation, inspection, pretty much anything to do with binaries. And you can, do, you can download the source and have a look through it. It's not particularly big, it's, it's quite readable. Uh, the complexity comes in because it supports basically anything with a Turing complete instruction set. I mean, if your toaster can run instructions, Binutils will support it. It's, it's very, very comprehensive. Um, but today we're going to be focusing on x86 and ELF and modern Linux because I assume that's what pretty much everyone here uses. All right, so some of the tools included with it include GDB, which uh, typically binarizes a room. A lot of people have a love-hate relationship with GDB. Uh, hopefully I'll show you guys some features of GDB you haven't seen before. Um, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Uh, the assembler. Uh, the linker, and object dump, uh, which I use all the time now, it's uh, uh, quite useful. Um, so, as a programmer, I started out programming C and C++, and I believed a lot of fiction about uh, how programs work, and so in this talk, hopefully uh, I can, hopefully you don't all know what I'm talking about already, um, and so I used to believe what's on the slide. I used to believe that each stage in this was a black box, you had your build system, be it make, CMake, these days, Bazel, and it invoked the compiler, and the compiler produced a binary or a shared object library that you could just use. Um, it turns out that there are, there's quite a few steps uh, in between. Um, and another thing I believed was that once the binary is compiled, it's just the file that you can run, and there's not too much you can do with it. Um, that's completely false. And another thing which I'd like to show today is that life doesn't actually start out in main. And main can actually take three arguments. I don't know if you knew that, but I'll show you why. Um, anyways, so, so the purpose is to show how we can understand binaries in, in greater depth. All right, so without further ado, let me fire up my terminal because slides are very boring. Uh, also, apologies if the um, it's just quite awkward how, oh, never mind. All right. Okay, so I would like to show you a fairly minimal binary that I'm going, we're building an assembly. So you might think, oh no, please don't show us assembly. What are you doing? I don't understand that, that's horrible. Um, but this is not quite a minimal ELF, but a minimal program but it's a simple assembly program that I'd like to show you, print something to stand it out without using libc. Um, so if I go ahead, jump to my shell, build it, run it, and I get hello Linux conf. And to, you know, it's pretty boring, hello world, but let's actually see what's going on in, inside of this. So Inside of um, x86, inside of assembly, we can segment it into different parts, which are basically functions. Um, and so inside of the text section, now just, just to clarify, when a binary is running, um, it has several sections inside of both the binary, uh, which correspond to sections inside of uh, the memory of the process. Now the text section is the data segment uh, sorry, is the segment where the code is kept inside of 
uh, both the assembly and of the process uh, in memory, and I'll show you that in, in just a second. So um, it turns out that the entry point for a modern file is not main, but it is a function conventionally called underscore start, which is on line 23. And so this is the entry point to a program. So typically, if you look at a program compiled with libc and you run a backtrace, you'll find that if you are on the main thread, the very first function that gets called is start. Now, libc takes start and uh, a number of things which the operating system puts onto the stack and bundles it up into the nice main method which you typically call. All right, so I know nobody's interested in staring at a page of assembly, but what I would like to show you is um, this line over here, or these couple of lines. What we're doing is we're calling the right system call. Um, you know, so we're ch we are moving one, which is the num I believe that's the number of the system call, uh, into EAX, EDI, conventionally in the x86, is the first argument that we pass into a function, which is the same way you do a system call. Um, and then the second argument is our message, and in the assembler, GNU, GNU assembler, converts this label, because it is just a label, into the address of this piece of data here. Now, everything is based on addresses, but fortunately, in, assemb in the assembler, we can refer to things by labels. The assembler will then take that and convert it into uh, an offset, not, not strictly an address. Then the linker will turn that offset into an actual address in the final binary, and I'll show you what I mean fairly soon. All right, and then uh, we call syscall, which is basically an interrupt, and then the kernel handles that. Okay. So, but that's not terribly interesting. Who wants to stare at a page of assembly? Um, let me show you my make file briefly. There's quite, quite an, oops, it's quite an important flag here, uh, which is to compile, which is to use the assembler and assemble this file with debugging symbols, so that when we open it in GDB, we will be able to see um, the original source uh, alongside. Um, the assembled program. So just a, a brief overview. Um, typically, a program is assembled, and then I will show you the file that it gets assembled to. So you run make. Well, it's just remove prog, so it runs again with debug symbols. Or, oh, well, never mind. So we have that file called prog.o, and it's just a binary. Let's open it up in Vim, see, well, oops. Well, what is it? Oh, well, it's a mess. Let's view it in hex. Still a mess, not terribly comprehensible, not very interesting. Well, it turns out that as part of binutils, there are several programs that you can use to inspect such a binary. One of them is called objdump. Um, so I'm going to use that now. Objdump, and you pass the flag capital D for disassemble, and then you give it your binary. And the cool part about objdump is that it supports not just ELF, but uh, a.out. And uh, I think on, I uh, stand to be corrected, but on MinGW it can process portable executables as well, which is really cool if you ever have to cross over to the dark side. Um, okay, so if we run objdump on my program, or at least on the O file, now remember that the assembler converts labels, uh, labels of functions, labels of pieces of data, not to addresses, but to offsets within the file. So if we do an objdump on prog.o, uh, uh, sorry, the screen is a lot smaller than I realized, uh, we'll see that um, our function greet is assigned address in hex 17, exit 33, and start. I should mention that that exit is a home-baked exit function. It's not uh, libc's one. Uh, again, we put the syscall into EAX, the syscall number into EAX. We put the first argument, again, conventionally into EDI, and we call syscall, um, which is the, uh, well, it's one way to exit a program. Uh, in Linux. And so over here, if we go down to message, you'll notice all of this assembly. Um, now that's absolute nonsense. Uh, it's just because objdump is interpreting this part of the, uh, you see those numbers, 48, 65, 60, uh, t that is hello world, if you see that's, uh, in, if you know <laughs> your ASCII and hex for whatever reason, you'll notice that's H-E-L-L-L, you know, et cetera, space world, and then uh, a uh, null terminator. Um, so I guess that's kind of cool. Question? It's something that your greet function yes. has a third value there, mark OX 
11 EDX, okay? Yes. That is 17, which is the length of your halal line. Yes, that's correct. Okay. But then your new line function has a similar line. Yes. It's moving a 5. Why are you smoothing Oh, uh, I left that in there by accident. That was brain fart. It's, it's, it's not logical. It should be a, a different value. But nothing bad happens if, if you do it. Um, yeah. Uh, technically, it, uh, it's actually a really good question why it, why it doesn't, uh, nothing, nothing bad happens. But yeah, I certainly did make a mistake. Very good eye. Um, okay. Um, but uh, otherwise, you happy with? <laughs> All right, good. Um, okay, so um, this is not the final binary. The final binary is, a pro is of course, prog, which is assembled. Let me actually, I'll actually do it again. So we have prog.o, which is our object file, which is not executable, not just because the uh, executable bit is, let's, 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 let me show you. So we've got schmod plus x, prog.o. If we try and run it, it still won't run because it's, it's nonsense. It's not an actual ELF. It's just, well, it is an ELF. It's uh, not executable yet. So we run the linker, which is a program which takes uh, object files and converts it into a, well, either another object file or a binary. Um, it's just a way of collating various object files and converting them to another one um, in such a way that um, uh, the offsets in the files get uh, converted into actual addresses which can then be referred to in the program later on. Uh, okay. So if we run objdump on my program, instead, we'll notice that um, there's my, uh, we have actual addresses now. We don't just have offsets within the file. Uh, and conventionally, the data segment starts uh, at four, uh, I can't believe I'm saying this out loud, but four maybe bytes inside of the uh, ELF file conventionally because there's a whole bunch of other things inside of uh, uh, the binary. But static things are not particularly fun. So let's open up my program in GDB. Now, this is the GDB that most people grow to hate. I certainly did uh, until I was told about uh, the TUI feature. Just a show of hands. Who uses TUI? Who has used TUI? Wow, OK. Well, it turns out that GDB has a cursors based visual debugger. Um, now, who's excited to see that? Yay, one person's excited to see a cursors-based visual debugger. Well, I, I certainly was a bloomer mind. So anyways, uh, let's put a breakpoint on start. There's a GDB bug I'm avoiding by doing that. All right, now let's run, I press R to run the program. And it starts executing the program as normal, but it is placed a breakpoint uh, using the ptrace syscall um, onto the start function. So press run. All right, and now you can see where, we are, where I am. Now there's, I can go list, and I can see where I am in the source. You think, okay, cool, you can, okay, great, you can see the source. Um, but if I press Control X2, that puts me into the cursors-based visual debugger. And if your program is compiled with symbols, or alternatively, if you, there's a way to feed in a symbols file into a program, with, to debugging a program compiled without symbols, we see where we are. And you can, up doesn't go back to the previous command anymore, it goes back to where we are. And so interestingly, we can see both the source file in assembly and the actual address of the instruction. And that address lives in the data segment of the program. And you might think, OK, these things are very abstract. You're talking about the data segment. Later, you're going to mention the stack and the heap. Where are they? Can I inspect them? Can I see what's in there? And the answer is, well, it's Linux. Of course you can. So I'm going to use the proc subsystem. Uh, before I do that, um, I'm going to find, so in GDB, the program being debugged is referred to as the inferior, uh, GDB, for whatever reason. So if we find out, tell me more about the inferior. There we get its PID. Using its PID, we can use the PROC subsystem to see what memory, uh, uh, what the various segments of memory the process uh, has. Um, so let's do that. Uh, what's it, 8901. So we can go cat proc 8901 maps. And there we have a list of the various sections in memory. You'll notice that this program doesn't have a heap. Well, why not? Because it doesn't need one. I actually am never invoking any, I'm not invoking break or s break. And uh, there it is. So we'll notice that on the left hand side of each line, 
you will have the start address and the end address of the segment in memory. Um, that file here is the binary. And so um, the instructions are held within these two in this range of addresses. That address is, of course, a virtual address local to my executable. And conventionally, in Linux on x86, uh, it starts out at that address, which is four maybe bytes uh, into the binary. Um, it turns out you can't actually access stuff in, in lower memory addresses. Uh, there's some uh, CPU protections. Anyways, um, so we see that our program starts out at that address um, with a whole number of instructions. But inside of the binary itself, we just have instructions. We don't have any labels. So when a function call, so where we are now, we are in a function call. There we go, call queue. Uh, it provides the address of the function to call. Uh, and uh, the assembler knows, uh, or at least the uh, CPU knows, um, x86 calling conventions. Uh, the idea is that basic function calls are built into um, x86. Um, and it, uh, what I'd like to show you is there is a section of the program called the stack. And now in computer science courses, you learn about the stack and the heap, and there's pictures in a textbook, and it's uh, kind of abstract. But uh, Proc tells me that that's the stack. So can I inspect the stack? And the answer is you, you certainly can. So let's copy that address. Oh, well. All right, and so let's see what, uh, let's see 10. Let's see what is on my stack. Well, it's not terribly interesting, but uh, the first uh, couple of things are just uh, zeros on my stack. But remember that the stack grows down, so we're actually not looking in the right place. You should be looking at the other end. Um, but the cool part is that um, we can see the stack, we can see where we are. Now if I press Control X2 again, we can see the processor registers. Now that's fantastic. I mean, when I was you know, learning to program C or C++, I thought this has been incredibly interesting. Um, and so most of the register values aren't terribly interesting, but the, one, the ones that are are RSP, uh, which points to where we are on the stack. Now the stack, again, is a region in memory and it is used for control flow. Um, so you put on the stack, it's, it's kind of beyond the scope of this to explain exactly how stack works, but um, we can see what the current stack pointer is. And so let's see what's, let's see what's on the stack. Uh, and then this address here. And we see there are a number of values on the stack. Okay. Um, oh, yes, cursors. But, yeah, that's fine. Oops. Okay. Um, so that's sort of the basic things you can do. But let's say that you were feeling enterprising and you wanted to build your own minimal libc to really understand how it works. Uh, so I'm not going to do that or show you that. But here's a sort of very basic, uh, sorry, I still may be in vim, let me, yeah, let's, let's quit. Okay, let's go to my, it's quite an awkward typing angle. Okay, um, let's open up this directory and we will see that I have my program, which is helpfully in a readable language. And uh, let's open up, uh, Okay, so I've written exit inside of an assembly file because GCC will compile down any function you write to have um, additional assembly code in it which, whose purpose is to um, return to the previous function upon uh, the function ending, but exit doesn't return. Uh, so there's no point in putting, you know, restoring the base pointer and anything like that. So we just have an instruction to move number 60, which is the six exit, syscall, not exit, uh, to EAX. Um, we run syscall and halt to stop the program. Halt is technically not necessary. Linux will kill the process, but um, that's a Linux-specific thing. Anyways, so 
Um, inside of my code, I have this function, break. Now, again, we talk about the stack and the heap, and again, the stack and the heap are regions inside of the memory of the process uh, managed by the operating system. But you saw in the last one that we didn't have a heap. So where is the heap? Can we inspect the heap? What can we know about the heap? Um, and it turns out that we can. Let's uh, compile this thing. All right, there it is. And I run it in GDB. I'm going to put a breakpoint on start again, or else GDB will crash. I'll run it. All right, now I'd like to know what the PID is. Oops, info inferior. Oh, well, it actually just says the PID. I didn't even notice that. OK, and then we can go, what is that PID? I can't believe I've got it. Mine 064. You'll notice that there's still no heap. Why does my program not have a heap? I thought, any, I thought all programs have a heap. Well, turns out that it doesn't have a heap until you ask for one. So if you come to our code, and I'm calling my exit on, based on the value of main. So if I press S, S steps through. Uh, and just in, in GDB, the line highlighted is the line about to be executed. So end is a pointer that is uh, refers that is going to refer to the end of uh, the heap. Um, so by calling break zero, we are asking for this. We're asking for the address of the end of the heap. But because there is no heap, Linux internally will um, create one for us and then return that address to us. So again, this is a sort of home baked break. This is not the standard library function. This is my own. And the way it calls the syscall again is to put the syscall into uh, EAX or RAX, and the syscall is just happens to be 12 in hex, uh, and then we call syscall. And there's no return statement here because I'm sort of being a bit, um, uh, I'm ignoring the convention somewhat, but uh, I know that uh, conventionally uh, the argument to this function, new end, is passed in in the EDR register. And the first argument to the syscall is also going to be passed into the EDR register. So if I don't do anything, it's still going to be in the EDR register. Similarly, the value returned by uh, the syscall is going to be in EAX, which is, again, going to be the return value of the function. So I don't have to have a return statement in there because the register values are going to be the same uh, as, though, um, uh, as though I had an actual return statement. So if I run step, all right, now if we go into our register view, you can see that that uh, instruction to move NordXC uh, into EAX worked. There we go. There's the value. And you'll notice that uh, RDI, which should, is zero, which is the argument that I, the first argument I passed into the function, since there's only one RDI, it's obviously zero. Uh, again, it's x86 convention, uh, what these registers' purposes are. Then you go step again, you're in our syscall. And there we go. We have the end of our heap uh, in our RAX register. But there was no heap. Well, let's go ask proc again. Oh, look at that. We have a heap. And there are its addresses. There's this address range. And if we go to RAX, we look, oh, look at that. There's the end of the heap. Isn't, isn't that great? So let's go back to my code, my C. And then I go, OK, well, let's say you wanted to write your own malloc or your own allocator. Uh, how does that work? Well, the very first thing you have to do is ask for more memory from the OS. So we're going to do that and use, again, the break syscall. Uh, and you put in the new address of the end of the heap that you would like. So you don't say how much memory you want. You just say, Linux, please extend the heap by, uh, to this address. And so you call it. And so let's just take note of the end of my heap. Well, it's going to be on screen anyway. I call break. And you'll see that in RAX, I have the new end of my heap. And so if I go back to proc and I ask, oh, look at that, my heap is now larger because I asked for more memory. Um, I see that I'm running out of time, so I won't lecture you too much more. But I would like to show you uh, that something quite interesting. So I use .NET Core quite a lot. Uh, it's kind of an amazing technology. Uh, and these days, .NET Core compiles down to binaries. So if we, so I've got a small program in here. 
program, which is a small little resource leaker, but uh, it's great for demonstration purposes. It opens up a socket and starts listening. And so this is C Sharp from Microsoft, the former evil empire. This used to only run on Windows. But these days, you can run .NET build. And you wait a little bit. And inside of bin, oops, inside of bin, you get a binary that you can run and inspect in GDB. That's amazing. Let's put a breakpoint on socket, because socket is a syscall that I know this program is going to be calling. It's not defined because it hasn't been loaded yet, because it's a dynamic library. So I go yes. Then I go run. And look at that. I hit my breakpoint, which is the socket call being called by this program. And I can get a backtrace and see exactly how I got here. Uh, and if you compile uh, the uh, CLR, the common language runtime, with debugging symbols, you can see exactly where um, inside of the CLR your, your code is running. Moreover, if your code is jitted, um, um, you, can, you can see where, where it's running. And that's quite incredible. So let's put a breakpoint on read and continue. Continue. And you can see every time the read syscall gets called, we have a breakpoint. Um, it's really, I think it's incredible that you can now uh, you know, debug your, let's say you, you had a problem and all of a sudden you were calling some function that wasn't working, you can now uh, debug your c sharp based code with tools that are you know, 35, 36 years old and based on Linux. It, it, the world really is changing, it's, it's quite amazing. Um, yeah, I'd like to quit. Um, oh, one other thing which I wanted to show you very, very briefly, and I'm going to rush through this. So, as I said before, my brother and I do trading software, so here's a little simulation of some trading software. Uh, when I say simulation, it's like a simulation of a simulation of a simulation. And anyways, so um, inside of my downloads folder, I have a program called Fix Simulator. Uh, just very briefly, uh, the financial world uses a protocol called Fix to send orders to and from brokers and stock markets, etc. It's an extremely simple protocol, predates HTTP. It is literally key value, key value, key value, key value, um, uh, message size, and then that's the message. So I'm going to run my Fix Simulator, which is basically a fake exchange. And so you don't have to worry about that too much. But here I have my service, which I pretend is a production service. Now let me launch it. it tells me that I'm logged on and I'm using line noise uh, to take input. And let's say that I wanted to place an order to buy 1,024 Apple stocks. So I place the order and my fake exchange gets it. Now, great. I acknowledge my order and things are good. I get an acknowledgement. And now, let's, at the end of the day, the stock exchange sends a message called done for day, which lets you know that your order is, is complete and nothing more will happen. So if I click done for day, oh no. Now your customer's buttered because their service has gone down. You look like an idiot. What are you going to do? Well, you could check the logs and see what happened. Um, that's not terribly interesting. But there's that little piece of information there, core dumped. Well, what's a core dump? Well, let's open, out, open it up in Vim. Huh, it's an ELF. What do we know about ELFs? Well, we can use bin utils to inspect them. More, since I'm running out of time, we're not going to, but I'm going to show you that you can load up GDB. Not only is GDB now running that program, but it's running it with a copy of the actual memory from that crashed program inside of it. So we can see if we've run over our uh, stack pointer, let's run a backtrace. No, haven't run over our stack pointer. In fact, nothing looks wrong. Let's see how many threads we are. Maybe it's on another thread. Oops, info thread. I promise organizers I'm nearly done. Okay, let's change to the next thread, thread two. 
and then we see, let's get a backtrace. Where are we? Hmm, line 111. Now let's go here. Oops. And we can see exactly where we were when we sag faulted. Oops. No, that may be. Let's do that again. It keeps doing that. Sorry, that was an old core dump. Uh, okay, now let's run my program again. Logged on by 1024 Autodesk. Let me acknowledge the order. Let me down for date, causing that crash. And again, everyone's very upset. You don't go look through logs. GDB prog core. And then we see, uh, there we go. There's our line. We have a divide by zero error. Let's print last price. And you can see that it's zero. And uh, if you combine this with Docker, not only can you find out exactly what the environment was, you can have an actual copy of the memory. Also, just a caveat, be careful about sending core dumps to your developers or anybody else, because the core dump is the whole of the copy of the memory. And remember that I said that Linux puts environment variables into, your, um, into memory on the stack. So if we run strings on the core file, every string inside of there is now visible. That includes keys, secrets, Oops. So just, yeah, a caveat. Be very careful. Your environment variables. <laughs> I choose creative names for my environment variables. They may be uh, displayed. So just uh, a word. Careful. All right. Uh, thanks uh, for listening, everybody. And uh, if anybody's got any questions, if we have time for questions, then... Uh, so, yeah, we have time for one or two questions. Are there any questions? Uh, hi, it's a bit more reverse engineering, but have you looked at uh, Radar 2 and Cutter at all? It's a, Radar 2 is a kind of Python framework for working with binaries, and then Cutter is just the front end for it. It's like the open source version of uh, IDA Pro. Yes, yeah, no, I have. Uh, have you heard of Jidra? Oh, it's uh, released by... Uh, it's released you mean by the, the backdoor version of the open source <laughs> IDA Pro? Bas basically, except uh, I wanted to show some GNU tools that are open source that you can contribute to, that you can use on any old distro. I mean, you can fire up your you know, Red Hat 9 box from forever ago, and this will still work. Um, yes, uh, those tools exist, and certainly for reverse engineering, they would probably be better. Uh, also, Jidra is you know, closed source from the NSA. I'm not running that on my machine. Thanks. All right, any other questions? Okay, and okay, that's it. Um, yeah, thank you, Daniel. Cool. That's a pretty cool talk. Uh, yeah, I will close. <laughs>